Well, welcome back. We're now going to move on and talk about some of the ways of valuing services and some of the challenges that we encounter. Now, we've already talked about the link between uh, the state and the function of the system, and now we need to look at how you translate all of this into the economics. Now, economists have a number of different ways of valuing um, ecosystem services. And if we start by looking at market services, which are things you can put a dollar value on, um, there's a variety of techniques. And the first might be travel cost, which is how much have people paid in order to go and see something. It might be that people are willing to pay an awful lot of money to go to see the Grand Canyon. So they will incur a heavy cost, implying this is a very valuable place uh, and is a very valuable cultural service in this case. Another way is looking at hedonic pricing. And so we know that if you look at the value of houses and house prices, those house prices that command the best views of the ocean also command a premium price. And that increase in price is effectively a valuation of the benefit that that sea view is providing to people. Another example would be replacement cost. We know that coral reefs provide a natural service in terms of attenuating wave action and the impact on coastal shores. Well, if you didn't have a reef out there, maybe what you would have to do is replace that natural service with an unnatural one, such as building a seawall. You can work out how much does it cost to replace that service with a man-made uh, intervention. Or equivalently, if you're looking at the uh, role of coral reefs, maybe in, in reducing the amount of wave energy that reaches the shore, you might ask, if we didn't have that coral reef anymore, how much would that drive up the costs of impacts when we have a cyclone? Um, another way of valuing the, the, the benefits that we get by having a natural barrier out there in the ocean. Other ways we can look at things are direct values. For example, um, you could easily value the contribution of fish to a local economy by looking at the price of those fish and how many are being caught. Uh, now, you can also get into the more uh, sort of difficult service valuation that we've just been talking to by looking at a production function, and an ecological production function that relates some measure of the state of a system directly to some kind of benefit. And we've already given the example of mangroves producing more fish through their nursery habitat functions. And this is another way you can value that in terms of the increase in fish and put a dollar of value on that increase in fisheries yield that might follow from that. If we want to then look at the methods people use to value non-market services, these are the services that you can't easily put a dollar value on. There's a whole range of different options. and One of these is contingent valuation, where you say to somebody, how much would you be willing to pay to uh, maybe enter this marine reserve? Or how much would you be willing to pay to go and have an even better biodiversity experience when entering that terrestrial park? Another way you can do it is to provide people a set of scenarios and, and give them a choice and from the decisions that they make, figure out what is it that they're really valuing. So an example might include talking to divers after they've been out on the boat and they're going out looking at a variety of dive sites. And you might give them a set of options and say, well, you know, dive option one might have relatively few fish, but there's going to be quite a few big ones. Dive option two has more fish but not so many big ones and you give them these options and they look through them and maybe if they really value big fish they plumb for dive option number one and so from that choice that they've made you can figure out what is it that they're actually valuing about that ecosystem when you take all of these economic values and put them together for coral reefs globally we end up with uh, a really very large number that it's estimated that the total value of coral reef ecosystem services is around 30 billion US dollars a year. And if you break that out among the major sorts of services, then it's a fairly equitable split between tourism, fisheries, biodiversity and coastal protection. So all of these things are important and we're benefiting in a myriad of ways from coral reefs. The first of these we're going to focus on comes from trying to operationalize these services. And one of the things we'd often want to do is think, well, we have a number of different scenarios, perhaps for development. How could you work out the degree to which this development scenario is going to influence the benefits we receive from these ecosystems? And to do that, we need to be able to 
essentially predict how a change in the drivers of those services influence the values we uh, derive from them. So if we just look at this logically, first of all, there'll be some direct drivers of change that will affect the state and the function of the system. So we'd need to be able to relate things like resource consumption. How does that affect the state and the functions that these ecosystems provide? Climate change, a very important one for changing the states of systems. We might want to consider how does a change in, in our policy towards climate change alter the future benefits we derive from ecosystems. Changes in land use, that is obviously very important on land, but it also affects the ocean, as we talked about in the uh, local disturbances lecture and all the problems we get with eutrophication, for example. Then there's uh, species introductions and removals. We talked about lionfish as an important invasive species and the impact that that might have on the services that we benefit from uh, in ecosystems. We have to factor in that technology is going to change and that might change the options and the way in which we manage ecosystems. And lastly, the things that biologists are usually most comfortable with, things like the natural, physical and biological processes that govern the health of ecosystems and the dynamics of ecosystems. But at the same time, we have to think about how the valuation process by people is also changing. And so for that, we have to think about some of the indirect drivers of change, such as demographic trends. For example, immigration. Are we going to see a change in the types of people living in an area? Maybe they've come from a different country to seek work, and they might have a different set of values of how they view the environment. We can think about the economic climate. Are we in an area where people have apparently the luxury to consider um, recreational time and benefit from ecosystems? Because the economy can dictate much of, of how we spend our free time and how we spend our free time. Cultural and religious aspects. Different cultures have different associations with the environment. Different religions have different associations with the environment as well. And then, of course, the wider social political environment. And I mean, a really extreme case might be a country that's in the midst of civil war they may have no time to think about valuing a whole variety of ecosystem services. So all of these things have to be considered if we're trying to operationalize the valuation of ecosystem services and make it work for us. Another problem is more of, a, of a, an ecological one, and that is trying to figure out the incremental changes in state and how that relates to a function and service. Now we're now familiar with this example of coral reefs providing habitat for fish and how we can then uh, fish those fish and derive a livelihood and a source of food. But often the question that's facing managers is maybe there's going to be a deterioration of that habitat quality. And so what we're really talking about now is we're going to see maybe a decline in that habitat quality and are going to reduce the numbers of fish. But the question for an ecologist is to what extent does a small change in the complexity of that reef or the amount of live coral really alter the process of fish production? Because that's often a very difficult thing to measure in the environment. The environment is full of all sorts of stochastic processes. It's difficult to measure things very precisely. And so this makes our job relatively challenging. Okay. Now ultimately, this is the kind of relationship we might want to have. This is a kind of ecological production function. So we might want to know the relationship between fisheries productivity and the complexity and health of a coral reef. Now at this point, we have no idea what the shape of that relationship is. Is it a linear decline? Is it curvilinear? Um, finding out that, that answer to that question is very important if we're to convey uh, an accurate scenario of how perhaps not managing a reef effectively could lead to a reduction in the complexity of the reef and then how that would translate to a reduction in the amount of fish that people can harvest from that ecosystem. Another thing we have to bear in mind when looking at valuation is that most ecosystems provide more than one service and sometimes if you only value some of those services you can get a fairly biased perspective of the true value. And so if we take the example of mangroves we know that mangroves deliver all sorts of functions. They provide a nursery habitat and even an adult fish habitat. They provide fuel wood, they provide timber. They provide protection from erosion and to some extent disaster during things like tsunamis. 
they sequester carbon from the atmosphere, so they play a role in uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. They trap sediments coming out of rivers, which help keep reefs free of sediment and healthier. Um, and they can even detoxify pollutants. So we need to think about all of these services, ideally. And, and here's an example of how this can be important. So this is a study that was done in Thailand, looking at the value of mangroves. And the question was, one of the things you can do with mangroves is clear them and provide a pond to raise shrimps and have shrimp aquaculture. The alternative is that you leave the mangrove where it is and you sort of derive all those natural services from it. So if we look at this, and this is the value per hectare on the y-axis, that the mangrove estimates of some of the natural services are quite small. Timber and non-timber products, relatively small. If we add the, the value in this location of the nursery habitat, it's also relatively small. If we look at the perceived value that you could gain from that mangrove by clearing it and developing a shrimp pond, it seems to be much, much greater. We're now looking at $160 versus $2,000. So if you just stop there, you would conclude maybe the best thing we should do is just clear the mangrove and, and provide shrimp ponds. But that's only part of the story. So if you added the role of mangroves in terms of coastal protection, now you have a much, much larger uh, value to the people who are living near that mangrove. And equally, if we think about the, um, the shrimp pond thing in a bit more detail, we have to factor in that in fact there are subsidies that the government provide to people who are um, developing shrimp aquaculture and those subsidies need to be removed because they're essentially skewing the analysis. Also shrimp ponds do cause some pollution and so we have to factor in the cost that that pollution has on the environment on other ecosystem services. And then when you've finished with your shrimp pond you need to restore it or someone needs to restore it back to some useful state because Abandoned shrimp ponds can remain dormant for long periods of time. When you take all that into consideration, you end up with a very different outcome. Now, the total value of mangroves for these natural services is about $4,000, whereas the actual value for the shrimp farm is minus $8,000 plus. So here, factoring in all of the mangrove services and the full costs involved with having a shrimp pond gives a much more balanced assessment of the true comparison of the value of mangrove in this area.